Welcome back, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see you back here again. Now, our very first panel discussion this afternoon is about protecting the benefits of tourism in a multilateral world. It's not your typical, usual topic at these global forums. So what then is the intersection between multilateralism and tourism? Well, let's find out. It's a pleasure to invite to the stage our panelists, beginning with Her Royal Highness Dana Thiras, President of the Board of the Petra National Trust and also UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador. Rene Trabulsi, Minister of Tourism and Handicrafts of Tunisia. Zura Polorishkashvili, Secretary General of the World Tourism Organization. Majid Mohamed Shwaike, who is the Minister of Tourism and Antiquities of Jordan. And last but not least, Akbar al Bakr, Secretary General of the Qatar National Tourism Council, as well as CEO of Qatar Airways. And again, to moderate this session, it's a pleasure to welcome as well CNN's Zain Asher. The floor is yours. everyone. Um, I think we can all agree that tourism is a huge factor when it comes to economic growth and global development. Firstly, it's a massive source, especially for developing countries, for foreign exchange earnings. Um, it also tends to employ a higher percentage of women and young people, again, hugely important. But I think one of the most important aspects in terms of the benefits of tourism is really that in a world where technology, where rather jobs are increasingly being lost to technology, it continues to be labor intensive. I think the big thing though is going forward, how do we make sure that tourism continues to be uh, exclu um, inclusive rather and also sustainable? So um, I want to start with Secretary General. Thank you so much for being with us. We know that tourism is clearly a global development vehicle. When you think about tourism, uh, tourism is increasingly mentioned as part of the UN SDG Sustainable Development Goals, particularly number eight, which is decent work and economic growth, number, four, number 12, rather, responsible consumption and production, and also number 14, life below water. But you really think that tourism should be a part of all 17 UN SDG goals. Why? Good, good, in, good, good morning, uh, dear guests. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be uh, and to present tourism first time, by the way, on Doha Forum, because this is the first time when tourism took an important part of this forum, and I think this is the place to promote. And I, I don't want to, to talk about all 17 SDGs because it will take a long time. Yes, of course. But the most important thing for all of us, uh, and I'm sure that all of us we will agree that to create new jobs. We mentioned many times that the best recipient, this, the best opportunity to create new jobs, the fastest one is uh, tourism. Tourism can create, and we are supporting, and we are doing a lot of things to, to create new jobs all over the world. So always. Uh, this is our main objective. Now, there are some sub-objectives which goes in parallel with the, uh, cre to create the new jobs. First of all, it's education. Without competitive jobs, it's important to, to go parallel in the uh, fast-growing sector, which is one of the fastest-growing sector in, in the world. And for that reason, we, we are focused a lot of, on education. This year, we announced like a, year of education and tourism. Next year we want to go further and we are going to announce rural tourism year. We want to support new destinations, new places, new uh, tourism uh, opportunities again to create new jobs and to expand our knowledge and our educational centers worldwide. So uh, regarding your question I think of course, all the SDGs are linked with, uh, with, with the sector. There are lots of opportunities, lots of things to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that we all together, we can do a lot of interesting projects. One of them 
and I'm very thankful to our dear chairman of Qatar Airways and Qatar was who supported from the beginning uh, of my mandate, I started one year and, and a half ago, and we created and we launched it with IEU University, first ever online academy for tourism. This is a revolutionary project, and I want to thank again to Qatar Airways because, and the uh, chairman uh, to support uh, this project. This project uh, gives opportunities everyone to study and to learn and to know uh, basic knowledge and to have basic knowledge about tourism. Um, I think that next year we will focus and we will support to expand uh, these courses all around the world. Okay. Um, I do want to talk also, I think, equally importantly, about some of the things that draws tourism to various countries. We are going to talk about Petra in Jordan. Obviously, you're extremely passionate about that, Your Royal Highness. But where we are right now is obviously Qatar. Qatar is going to be hosting the World Cup in 2022. I want to ask um, Your Excellency Al Bakr, how are you positioning Qatar? The World Cup is no doubt going to be a watershed moment when it comes to tourism in this country. How are you positioning this country to take full advantage of that moment? Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm extremely proud to state that for the first time, uh, FIFA is uh, going to take place uh, in our side of the hemisphere. It is also the first time it is going to take part in a Muslim majority country. We have already started preparing well in advance for this, uh, for this uh, tournament. Uh, we are always ahead of uh, what we have to deliver. But what is very important is that this will really showcase my country its innovation, its capabilities, its culture, its heritage, everything that we are so proud of in this country, we will be able to showcase it to the world. And most importantly, the Qatar's capability to host an international event like FIFA. You know, even major countries sometimes have difficulty. You have already seen FIFA took place in several very large economies and very large countries. Till the last day, they were still preparing for the, uh, for the occasion. Mm -hmm. Qatar is already 90% ready uh, for it. We have done a lot of things that will really raise the, uh, the profile of my country. But what is also very important is that the FIFA club world that is taking place today, you have already seen that this is really the first step of the rehearsal, what we will be able to deliver. And you have seen how we have been managing a very complex situation mm -hmm. where uh, more than a game is taking place uh, uh, over here. We have just finished the, 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 uh, the golf tournament, which was again success where multiple matches were taking uh, place in uh, several uh, stadia. Mm -hmm. So we are really prepared. And what very important is that every Qatari is extremely excited, and not only Qataris, but also the, the people that have living, been living in Qatar, have developed, uh, taken part in developing my country, are really looking forward to this huge occasion that will be taking place in our country soon. So you can already imagine? Yes what people should expect. So beyond just being prepared, and I, I can see that but Qatar also, is... But also, let me interrupt you. Go ahead. Sports brings nations and people together. During the, uh, the Gulf Cup, you realized how we were all together. Regardless, without borders, we were appreciating the Gulf Cup, we were cheering the teams, People from all the countries uh, took part. All the countries were invited. And we respected every single team that played here as equal, as people from the Gulf, as Arabs together. Mm -hmm. And this is the spirit what uh, sports bring to uh, the country. Right, so sports tourism is all about unity. I understand that Qatar is very well prepared. But beyond the World Cup, after the World Cup, is over, how are you positioning the country to make sure that those visitors continue to come back? 
Uh, first and foremost, uh, tourism is a huge uh, industry where my country was really not paying the kind of attention we want to pay. My country uh, is very rich in heritage. My country is extremely rich in culture. My country has natural beauty that a lot of countries in our region, they don't have, but it was not developed. It is now my job as recently being appointed as the Secretary General of the National Tourism Council uh, to put Qatar very strongly on the map of the world. What we are going to do is to bring people together. And this very painful day in 2017, when certain doors for us was closed, we tried to open up new doors. We tried to embrace the people of the world. We were the first country in the region to open up 80 nationalities to come without visas. And today, we are more than 90 countries that come to Qatar without visa. It is my aim as the National Tourism Council uh, uh, Secretary General, and also fully supported uh, by uh, uh, my ruler, His Highness uh, Sheikh Tamim, that we want to be a country that will invite all the countries of the world to come here without visa, so that we demolish the borders that are dividing people, and we prove to the world that Qatar is open arm mm -hmm. to receive and grow our industry. So post-2022, we will continue our march to promote tourism, but what is very important, that I'm very impatient with the mandate and the confidence uh, shown to me by my ruler, to appoint me in this uh, very important uh, job and a very important industry for the future of my country that I need to deliver now. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait until uh, after 2022. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Your Royal Highness, I want to turn to you because the first thing, when people think about Jordan, the first thing they automatically think about is of course Petra. Petra is very near to your heart. Um, you think about the archaeological ruins, you think about the fact that it was built thousands and thousands of years ago by the Nabataeans, um, and you fight every single day to persuade the government of Jordan to enact tougher legislation to protect sites like Petra. Why is cultural heritage such an important part of social cohesion and economic prosperity, in your opinion? Thank you very much, um, and I'm incredibly grateful to be here. This is a wonderful forum and, and um, you know, uh, cultural heritage and, and tourism are very closely linked and they're very closely related. And the statistics have shown that about 37% of international tourists have a cultural motivation. That translates to 4.2% of global GDP and 125 million jobs, and that's just the cultural sector. So it does, it makes financial sense in terms of tourism. But beyond that, there is so much that's associated with cultural heritage that is an incredible opportunity for economic prosperity for countries. You have cultural, cultural industries, which are currently estimated at, I think it's a $1.7 trillion industry globally. Cultural production, jobs, um, real estate becomes more valuable in areas where, where cultural heritage is well managed and, and well protected. Um, and so there are all of these direct economic values that are related to, to cultural heritage. Beyond that, it's, it's, we've got to expand the way we think about cultural heritage. And traditionally it's always been that you know, it's one, in, one part, integral part, but it's one part of the tourism industry. And I'm always saying that it's the other way around. The tourism industry and the cultural heritage industry are strong, they're separate, but they're very closely related. Mm -hmm. Tourism, for, for those of us who fight for cultural heritage, is a means through which to promote cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Very important, but, it, but it's a means. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about multilateralism. So this debate, this forum is all about you know, governance, multilateralism, collaboration. How do we deal with incredible challenges that the world is facing moving forward? Political, social, economic. You know, what, what is the landscape going to look like mm -hmm. in a few years? And how do we deal with it? And I'm always saying that a big part of the answer lies in understanding our cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, you know, you, 
Petra was built by the Nabataeans, but you know, the history of Petra goes back many, many years ago. There's a Neolithic site in Beda, in Petra, that's, that's 10,000 years old. So we are talking about um, history that has spanned uh, generations, thousands of years, people who have come and gone, differences. And so when we're talking about social cohesion, we're talking about identity. Mm -hmm. When we look at the future and the challenges that the future um, poses for all of us, how do we know how to equip the current generation with the tools necessary to deal with future challenges if they don't know who they are? We have to look into our identity, our roots to understand who we are, what is important to us, what motivates us, why would we act? If we understand that, we can understand identity. Cultural heritage um, gives a sense of rootedness, of belonging. When you're talking about development, the sustainable development goals, and we're talking about resilience and adaptability, mm -hmm. we have thousands of years of lessons throughout history of people dealing with climate change, with, with scarcity, um, taking specific actions that enable them to respond to, to different changes. You look at the Nabataeans and their incredible hydrological systems, their water system. They knew how to deal with water scarcity. And so there are incredible lessons for creativity, for innovation, for adaptability that can help us equip a new generation of young people to deal with global challenges. Um, one group that certainly, and you've talked about this, one group that really does understand how important and how precious cultural heritage really is, is ISIS. We've seen them, I mean, it broke my heart just seeing the images of what they had destroyed in Palmyra in Syria, in Hatra in Iraq. When ISIS, when Daesh destroys these archaeological sites and, and divides us and um, essentially ruins an element of cultural identity, what does humanity lose? So I think one of the things that motivated me to become much more vocal about this issue was the destruction that we have seen in, in our part of the world and what Daesh has done. And I think the one silver lining is that, that so much more attention, so much more focus is now um, directed at the importance of cultural heritage and why we have to invest in our cultural heritage. Um, what essentially Daesh was trying to do. Daesh was trying to erase memory. They are afraid. They are afraid of thousands of years of human connections. They are afraid that we look around and we recognize that at the end of the day, there's a common thread of human history that unites all of us. There are values that we all share as human beings, values that we celebrate today in our current global governance systems. So what they were basically trying to do is physically and psychologically to erase those connections between people, to erase a narrative that embraces diversity, that embraces differences, and replace it with one that rejects diversity, with one single narrative, um, which is the path to discrimination, to, to atrocities against people. And, and that, that essentially was a lesson for me about not only why you know, cultural heritage is so important in my country, but globally how important it is to, to ensure that the global narrative about who we are and about what connects us is one that embraces diversity and embraces differences. And I think this, this narrative is, is very important to think about and to promote, particularly when we're talking about a multi lateral world and, 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 a, and a world that, a world that um, should have collaboration between people and between nations at the core of it. I want to talk about the importance of building a really resilient tourism sector in the face of many threats. I want to turn to you, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Trabelsi of Tunisia. Um, Mr. Trabelsi is going to address us in French. So those of you who speak English or Arabic, if you could use your headset so we can all understand. Um, Your Excellency, Tunisia, as we know, has suffered a handful of lone wolf attacks. You think back to the attack in Tunis, the Bardo National Museum. You think back to the same year, 2015, the attack uh, where a lot of British people died in Sousse. Um, 
at a, at a beach holiday resort and several other smaller attacks, including this year near the French embassy. What is the strategy to building a much more resilient tourism sector in the face of these threats when you have European tour, tour operators uh, essentially cancelling their tours following uh, an attack? Okay. Merci. Tout d'abord, je voudrais remercier les, les, organisateurs, les organisateurs de nous avoir invités, surtout m'avoir permis à assister à ce panel. Aussi, je voudrais, euh, en me trouvant ici au Qatar, Féliciter le projet Dier Qatari à tous heures. Comme vous le savez, dernièrement, on a inauguré le, un superbe hôtel dans le désert tunisien qui s'appelle Alantara avec 93 villas. Et aujourd'hui, euh, il se trouve que ce projet, un des meilleurs euh, investissements en Tunisie qui a été fait par les Dier Qatari, il, est, il a été inauguré, ça fait 15 jours, et il est pratiquement plein à partir d'aujourd'hui jusqu'à 6 janvier, avec une moyenne de 400 500 euros les chambres et avec 18 à 4 000 dollars. Et pour vous dire que le tourisme en Tunisie de haute contribution commence à revenir petit à petit. Pour répondre à votre question, c'est vrai que la Tunisie a énormément souffert, déjà depuis 2011, mais surtout en 2015, on a eu trois attentats très très durs. L'attentat de, de Sousse et le musée de Bardot et un attentat contre la police présidentielle. La Tunisie a, a, depuis, la Tunisie a commencé à sécuriser les frontières et la ville et les zones touristiques. Et depuis 2017, on va dire qu'il y a un retour de tourisme en Tunisie. La sécurité, bien sûr, elle est primaire dans les, dans les hôtels. Nous, nous, nous avons sécurisé tous les hôtels, tous les zones touristiques, les musées, où les touristes visitent, les souks, les centres commerciaux, les centres-villes. Tous ces centres-là ont été sécurisés. En 2019, nous avons fait un travail de faire revenir les touristes classiques, les pays européens qui ont l'habitude de, de visiter la Tunisie. Nous avons réussi cette année, en 2019, à arriver à un objectif de 9 millions de touristes et donner la confiance à tous ces touristes, à toutes ces nationalités qui reviennent passer les vacances en Tunisie. Et en même temps, nous avons euh, remarqué le retour d'autres euh, tourisme, le tourisme de, de golfe, le tourisme euh, asiatique et surtout le tourisme le russe qui est devenu depuis 2016, la Russie, la Tunisie est devenue une destination à part entière. Euh, pour nous, c'est très important la sécurité. C'est très important de faire confiance, d'avoir la confiance des tour opérateurs. Nous pensons qu'aujourd'hui, la Tunisie a la même sécurité que n'importe autre pays européen. Nous, nous savons que c'est très important. Euh, facteur sécurité. Nous avons facilité aussi l'accès la, à la Tunisie par euh, la, suspen, la suspension des, des visas touristiques euh, et aussi aujourd'hui pour le, les zones culturelles, les, les sites archéologiques. Nous avons remarqué un retour extraordinaire des excursions dans les sites. Euh, vous savez qu'en Tunisie, il y a à peu près une centaine de sites. Certains ils sont euh, très anciens et très importants, très demandés par les, les touristes. Euh, Aujourd'hui aussi, la Tunisie est devenue un pays où le tourisme euh, médical est très important, le tourisme culturel, le tourisme écologique, le tourisme alternatif, qui est un sujet très important aujourd'hui pour la Tunisie. De plus en plus, on, on a des, 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 des produits, on a des hôtels, des maisons d'hôtes, des gîtes qui se montent dans l'intérieur de la Tunisie. Le, comme vous avez parlé tout à l'heure, la main d'œuvre est très importante. Donner à travailler aux gens en Tunisie, c'est quelque chose de très important dans le tourisme. Aujourd'hui, le PIB en Tunisie, c'est 14 points. Il y a à peu près 500 000 qui travaillent grâce au tourisme en direct et 2 millions en indirect. Le fameux projet Qatari dans la zone d'Outhouser, il fait travailler à peu près 300 emplois directs. 
et surtout ces employés ils sont dans la zone de, de désert tunisien, c'est des projets très importants. En tous les cas, moi je peux vous rassurer qu'aujourd'hui, le tourisme revient en force sur la Tunisie pour l'année 2020. Il y a une demande extraordinaire, pratiquement de monde entier, on commence à voir de, 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 des touristes qui viennent des des états unis de, de, de Canada et surtout du Moyen-Orient, c'est un retour à la confiance vers la Tunisie. Merci, Your Excellency. Donc, pour ceux d'entre vous qui n'ont pas ou qui n'ont pas de headsets, je vais essayer de juste résumer avec mon université level French. Basically, um, His Excellency was saying that, yes, it is true that there were several terrorist attacks and that did have a negative effect on the tourism sector. However, um, tourism is slowly beginning to come back thanks to an incredible amount of security that they've put in place in certain areas that tourists vi visit, including souks and various other areas. And now the tourism sector is coming back. They actually received about 9 million visitors so far this year. So thank you very much. I hope that was a good translation from uh, my university French. Thank you so much. So Your Excellency, um, one of the things, just going on to what Mr. Trabelsi said, um, about just the importance of developing a resilient tourism sector. Some people say that excessive tourism can actually lead to terrorism. Obviously, we know that Jordan is incredibly safe. There have been a few blips on the radar, but it's incredibly safe, one of the safest places in the region. But Petra actually received about 10,000 visitors in one day this year, which is a record number. For those people who think that um, excessive tourism can actually make a place less safe. What do you say to those people? Thank you so much, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. And I would like to thank uh, Excellency Akbar Bakr for, for his gracious hospitality, because honestly, I think being here together, just exchanging thoughts and, and dialogue is very important for the future. Uh, going back to your question, uh, each challenge has an opportunity attached to it. So definitely Jordan has shown its resilience and perseverance. And it has shown that it's an ambassador for peace in, in the region as well. We call it the safe haven of the region. Uh, that's why I think um, excessive tourism or let's say over tourism, which there are many, many uh, ways of addressing how can, uh, let's say, excess number of tourists at one place make us think what do we need to do in order to mitigate any risk with these uh, very important uh, historical places. One factor which we realized that for Petra, and we call Petra, Wadi Ram, and Aqaba the golden triangle. And definitely there is a huge demand for people to go there, which allows us to think of ways and means to mitigate this, let's say, flow of tourists in a very a proper way. That's why I would like to say to talk about utilizing technology as a mean to mitigate these risks. If we have the right technology, if we have the right connectivity, we can predict, we can plan, we can execute in a different way. That makes me again to think of the opportunities because Jordan, full of gems, it's not about Petra. Petra is the jewel crown of Jordan. <laughs> but there are other gems. That's why we started to focus on meaningful experiences other than the historical, let's say, cultural experiences. We talk about faith-based tourism. Faith-based tourism is very important, where we find in Jordan five sites known as pilgrimage, Christian pilgrimage sites. That's why we need to change the way we market Jordan. We need to change the way we package let's say when we address different tourists, that we have faith-based tourism, we have health and wellness tourism, we have adventure tourism, we have the filming industry that is becoming very new and it's, it's having a huge impact on local communities. So we look at these things and it obliges us to look at marketing, packaging, and communicating Jordan in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's why we're saying that collaboration and synergies and coordination between all stakeholders is very important. Local community is very important. Mm -hmm. The right bylaws in place is very important as well. We need to have modern enabling bylaws in order not to hinder the future growth of the tourism sector because tourism is not an industry. Tourism is becoming the 
industry mm -hmm. for future growth. That's why I think it's very important to work together, government, private sector, local communities, in order to make the best out of this industry. Yeah, you bring up a, a good point, Your Excellency. It's not just about Petra. It's not just about the Jordan of antiquity, the ones that we've read about uh, in the Bible, going to where Jesus was baptized. But there is a very, very uh, different type of Jordan, a very modern Jordan. Um, uh, Secretary General, I want to talk to you next about the importance of technology. And just to, a side note to everyone, there is a connections lounge in this building that I encourage all of you to visit today, um, where you can actually go to experience a virtual reality experience of, for example, old Sanaa in Yemen or the Congo or various other conflict regions in the world. It's a virtual reality experience. I encourage all of you to go today. But that brings me to my next point about the importance of technology in terms of bringing people together and allowing people to experience places that they wouldn't otherwise get to experience. Just talk to us about the importance of innovation, innovation in the tourism industry. I will, I will come back to football and congratulate okay. <laughs> because I love football and I will talk why I'm talking about football. Uh, I, I want to congratulate Qatar. And I will add two or three more remarks uh, our dear chairman mentioned. This is first time when the country with a population of two million will host the uh, World Cup. This is something very special. Uh, I mean, Uruguay, even Uruguay, where World Cup started in 32 has a 3.5 million. This is first time when Middle East and the region will host World Cup. Uh, if you remember only in Asia continent, if in the, in the continent so, so big, only uh, Japan and South Korea, they hosted World Cup during 100 years. This is first time when all of us, if we, you will invite us the Akbar, we can see all matches during uh, during the day without using an uh, airplane. This is something very special. This is innovation. Now, talking about football, we are the first UNWTO and again Qatar Airways uh, who started to link together sports and tourism. And uh, we announced first startup competition, tourism and sports, because again we want to link and to, we see that the tourism, sport is becoming the very uh, important uh, part of uh, tourism and we launch it uh, with the football club, club Barcelona. Why? Because football club Barcelona is only club in the world who is focused on innovation. And Barcelona itself like city and I'm sure that we will use Qatar like a nice showcase in innovation after World Cup and your, your question was very interesting. We, we are sure that we will use Qatar like nice showcase how to use infrastructure and how to continue the flow of tourists after World Cup uh, like visa. I want to congratulate and again we are using Qatar like a nice showcase for other member states how to open um, and how have country more accessible and Qatar is one of the best examples for, uh, for our member states and we are very proud to be the part of that uh, very important and interesting project. When we're talking about Agenda 2030, my opinion is that we don't need visa in 2030. Our kids does not need to know what this visa is. This is the main objective and I'm, I'm sure that we will reach it. Innovation is, uh, maybe you know that 95%, 95%, it's a huge figure, of all our travels are made by um, digital products or digital platforms, 95%. But it doesn't mean that uh, we need all around robots doing everything, uh, serving the meal or serving our drinks. No, we want to use innovation to create new jobs again. This is our objective. And uh, innovation is, oh, it's here, it's all around. Without new digital platforms and new uh, opportunities, we can't uh, move uh, and we can move forward. So for that reason, we created two international innovation hubs. One of them is in Argentina in Buenos Aires for, for the Americas, and the another one is in Madrid. And we started to announce, and we started to support small and medium-sized companies, enterprises, individuals, entrepreneurs, to help them to expand and to internationalize their projects all around the world. Uh, we made 10 startup competitions last year by regions, by thematic issues. One of them was sports and tourism. The another one was in gastronomy. In gastronomy, 
and the gastronomy is very big part of 30% uh, of income in tourism sector come from uh, from gastronomy and hospitality service and we are supporting all these entrepreneurs to internationalize their projects all around the world we made first startup competition in african region and it was amazing that we received more than 500 projects uh, during uh, one and a half months and uh, this is what we are doing and this is how we are supporting innovation in in tourism sector which is very important I don't want to uh, forgive, uh, forget the, the Tunisian case. This is another very important, and I want to congratulate Minister because um, after 2010, which is, was the best year for Tunisia, um, they are recovering, and as Minister mentioned, they have already 9 million, which is, I think, a big uh, t and successful story and we want to use like Qatar for visa Tunisia how to recover unfortunately after uh, this very difficult and tough situation and many countries has this kind of uh, issues and again it's complex you know it's not only about communication it's not about only security this is full package which country needs to be prepared mm -hmm. if there is a need of course and Tunisia is another very uh, interesting uh, show nice showcase for for our member states Right, so Tunisia has done a, an excellent job of, um, of actually bringing back tourists in the wake of... Um, of course, a Jordan, number of, another e e yes, a number example of for culture and tourism. Culture is, again, one of the... Culture and tourism are like brother and sister. And yeah. I mean, we are, it, it's the same, I, I think so. And uh, we always use uh, Jordan, one of the best examples, yeah. how to link culture with, with the tourism sector. Um, but speaking of resilience and speaking of... Um, bringing back tourism. Your Excellency Akbar, I want to just bring you into this because on the one hand, Qatar has an excellent opportunity with the World Cup uh, in a couple of years, but at the same time, it is dealing with regional politics, with the blockade. Just walk us through how you go about, again, just talking about resilience, talking about the fact that Qatar Airways lost a number of destinations because of the blockade, but I guess looking at things more positively, it forced you to diversify where your tourists come from and innovations um, and just sort of di differences in thinking when it comes to visa policies and that sort of thing. Just walk us through that. Uh, you are asking me uh, a question about my favorite subject. <laughs> Let me uh, uh -oh. tell you that uh, when it comes to resilience, I don't think there is any other country in the world that could prove resilience more than uh, my country. Um, I don't need to dwell upon the past, but you can see that you are here. You can see the interest Qatar has uh, gained. You can see how we overcome the biggest challenge in the history of my nation. And we came out of it with flying colors. First, you mentioned that I lost a uh, uh, a number of destinations, but uh, very little people know that we lost 18 destinations and we replaced it with 20. We have added 35 destinations from the time of that dark day of uh, 2017. Uh, Qatar Airways is uh, today the flag carrier of my nation worldwide, and what we did in this short period of just over two and a half years, is to continue our life, uh, to keep on innovating, to keep on uh, uh, promoting ourselves around the world. And there is nothing better promoting uh, Qatar around the world is Qatar Airways. Uh, I'm very proud also to say that just before I came here, uh, I was given statistics that, uh, issued by an international aviation body that Qatar Airways is the only airline that has grown in 2019 compared to our peer group in the region. Uh, two airlines have shrank, while Qatar Airways has grown with double digits. So it shows you the re resilience uh, Qatar has and its people have. And what we are going to do for uh, the FIFA, I know that I have very little time, so I don't want to prolong, because I'm sure you need to grill another couple of people here before we end. What it shows to the world is that we are absolutely prepared to all the challenges and we will make sure that we have done our job 
to the highest standards that is expected uh, by FIFA. And we have continued to prove ourselves, and we will continue to uh, prove ourselves in the future to deliver what everybody in the world expects from the state of Qatar. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Um, I do want to, before we, we only have five minutes left, but I think it's important to, um, for everyone in the audience to really understand the role that tourism plays in climate change and in sustainability, just because I think that's a very important uh, part of this discussion. Your Royal Highness, just explain to us, how does tourism factor into climate change? Because I think that there are very few people who understand what that link actually is. Well, I think to start with, um, tourism is, is an enormous industry. I mean, it's, it's you, you uh, the secretary of, of the UNWTO has, has given us some of the statistics. It's an enormous employer. It's an enorm enormous producer. It, it um, is part of, of many sectors, construction, food, uh, you know, transport, transport. And all of an industry of this size has to have an impact on uh, the, the emissions of, of greenhouse gases, carbon, and, and everything else. So naturally, yes, there is, there is a huge impact when it comes to, to global climate change. And given that this is such an important industry and one that is growing very, very rapidly and outpacing many other industries throughout the world, actually, in terms of its growth and interest, I think moving forward, um, it will continue to have an impact on, on sort of what I consider to be probably the most sort of existential threat to us as human beings and the systems and the earth that sustains us. And so for, for those who are involved in, in tourism, there's a great responsibility to understand what actions need to be taken today, given how vast the growth is going to be in the tourism industry. Um, I think the UNWTO has actually taken a couple of, of measures, um, including uh, encouraging people to take public transport and, and other uh, sustainable tourism becoming a very um, important uh, concept. And, and the definition of sustainable tourism has become much more part of, of the narrative and, 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 and the approach because of the efforts of UNWTO. So I think this is something that we need to consider very carefully. We need to consider very specific measures um, also related to the industry that can mitigate some of the effect of, of global climate change. It has the subject that is my favorite. It has an enormous impact on cultural heritage. There are sites that are disappearing, glaciers from World Heritage sites that will completely disappear. Um, you know, coastal areas that, that are already under threat from erosion and sea level rise. Um, so there are very serious threats to cultural heritage, for example. The tourism industry will be impacted more than probably any other industry with um, severe weather conditions. Um, you know, uh, it, it will disrupt movement. It will threaten uh, destinations that are, that are tourism assets as well. Um, and so it's a wide-ranging uh, actually threat to, uh, to, to global climate change that we have to be looking at. And because of how pervasive tourism is in terms of, of its connection to the various different sectors in any economy and its growth, I think it is very important to consider its impact on, on global climate change. And we have in sort of the cultural heritage field very important tools that we can, we can use to help mitigate uh, some of the impact on, on, on the global climate, including sort of age-old skills, knowledge that, that has been passed on from generation to generation that can help communities adapt and, and take the necessary measures to really um, do what is right, do the important thing. And just before we go, final question for Your Excellency René Trabelsi. Again, this answer will be in French. But I know that sustainable tourism is something that you're very passionate about. Tourism represents about 7 8% of Tunisia's GDP. But it is a factor when it comes to pollution, when it comes to issues when it, with, with transportation. How have you worked to make Tunisia's tourism sector that much more green and that much more sustainable? 
Oui, exactement. Ça sera euh, notre politique Indeed, pour euh, 2020. Euh, comme je vous ai dit tout à l'heure, 2019, c'était vraiment le travail. Ça a été de faire you, euh, retourner le, les touristes en Tunisie. 2020, c'est l'année de la de, de l'accueil, de services, de la qualité et de l'environnement. Très important, euh, depuis 2011, la Tunisie a été touchée par euh, ce phénomène d'environnement. Le tourisme durable, euh, il est dans l'actualité tous les jours en Tunisie. Beaucoup de, de projets. Nous sommes en train de travailler pour instaurer, par exemple, je vous donne des exemples comme les, les pistes cyclables dans les, dans les grandes villes, dans les zones touristiques aussi. Nous sommes en train aussi de travailler avec des partenaires étrangers pour l'élimination ou réduire le plastique dans les zones, dans les dans les grandes zones euh, touristiques, même dans les, les grandes villes. Et euh, il y a un travail qui est fait par la société civile. Et ça, c'est quelque chose d'extraordinaire en Tunisie. La société civile est très mobilisée pour l'environnement, pour le, 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 ce qu'on appelle le tourisme durable. Vous allez voir que dans quelques, quelques mois en Tunisie, il y a des, des projets euh, de l'intérieur de la Tunisie exceptionnels qui sont très demandés, qui sont même euh, proposés par des partenaires ou des bailleurs de fonds étrangers. Nous sommes d'ailleurs euh, preneurs des investisseurs. La Tunisie a besoin des investisseurs pour ce genre de, de projet. Euh, la GIZ est en train de travailler d'une façon exceptionnelle. Euh, Suisse Contact, c'est un fonds suisse qui est en train de nous aider énormément pour euh, ce tourisme euh, culturel et alternatif. Et euh, la Tunisie, je l'ai déjà dit, la Tunisie peut devenir un des meilleurs pays pour ce tourisme durable. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much. So you obviously, you obviously believe that the environment is a huge priority and you're working with foreign partners on various sustainable projects, including reducing plastic um, and eliminating pollution in some of the cities and making sure that um, people perhaps use bicycles and that sort of thing. All right, thank you so much. A round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you.